Welcome again in the infrastructure and messaging track. I am the next and last speaker of uh, this track. My name is Michał Ślaski, and I'll be talking about Mangoose IM, uh, which is a messaging server with a focus on scaling. Yeah, so what is Mangoose IM? This is an instant messaging server uh, that has been used in social media, gaming, telecommunications, uh, our focus is on high volume. Um, let it, it could be high volume traffic, uh, a lot of, lots of messages. It could be very many concurrent users connected or a mix of the two. And focus is on making it scale. We need to scale to really big numbers, as I will try to explain later. Uh, so we just try to make sure that we can scale. We can start with small deployment to handle relatively small number of users and over time add boxes or uh, well, scale with the number of users growing. Another thing here is uh, that this is highly customizable. As we have seen over the years, uh, every deployment of uh, such server has always to be customized. For example, you need to integrate with uh, custom authentication mechanism with uh, different uh, sort of databases of users. So another requirement here is actually to make it reasonably easy to customize the server. So some of the domains that we target uh, is are telecoms, uh, all sort of uh, messaging applications that mix uh, video, audio nowadays, but also chat, regular text chat feature. Uh, there are also social media websites where communication is a key part of it. Uh, and again, a chat feature, text communication uh, could enable such uh, social interactions. And then gaming, where the in-game chat system where many players of the online games can chat while they play or they chat so that they can actually dis discuss something before joining a gameplay. This is also uh, another use case and it has been widely used for such use case. Okay. Now, Mangoose IM, it supports XMPP, which is a messaging protocol. Um, it is used, for example, to interface with Facebook chat, uh, Google Talk chat feature. So this is quite widely adopted uh, messaging server, uh, sorry, protocol. Um, and there are quite a few libraries for all sorts of different uh, operating systems, including mobile operating systems like Android, iOS. So there is a selection of uh, uh, reasonably well-tested frameworks and libraries that support XMPP, which is good because uh, this enables some uh, quite interesting developments. How many of you have not heard about XMPP before? One person. Okay, I'll just quickly uh, say a few words about XMPP protocol properties. It's an open startup standard, um, so you can find some RFCs as well as so-called XMPP XMPP extensions on the XMPP.org website. Uh, it's secure through channel encryption, strong authentication. You can also isolate your network from other, if this is supposed to be, for example, a chat system for your company only, for internal use, you could isolate it from external network. It's flexible. Uh, XMPP is built on XML. Um, this is actually really customizable protocol. Uh, you can really add on, add on, uh, and make it uh, really custom if, if a need arises. Decentralized, meaning there is no like central XMPP server for the whole world. Each one of you can run your own and they will federate with each other. This is how you can send a message from one domain to another. Domains will federate. A little bit like, like emails, not but uh, <laughs> more reliably. Or in other words, you will not get that much spam as on email because uh, servers will have like direct uh, connection between, uh, between them and they, they will authenticate each other while connecting, while federating. Efficient, uh, meaning we don't poll, we rather have persistent connections like TCP or WebSockets. Uh, so this is more efficient than polling techniques. And proven, it uh, has been used for quite many years now. So there are really hundreds of deployments of uh, XMPP or sometimes referred as Jabbered servers out there. Okay, so enough about XMPP. 
some of the features that you can find in the Mangoose IM project. Uh, support for WebSockets, XMPP over WebSockets is uh, still a draft, but th this is going to be now standardized. Um, Multi-user chat is one of those extensions to the XMPP protocol. So XMPP defines some core um, building blocks, some core features of the protocol, and XEPS will extend this with different uh, custom stanzas, stanzas as in messages, packets of the protocol. So multi-user chat is one of such steps. Uh, for example, now we are streaming this video and underneath the streaming window on erlangcentral.org, you can find uh, a web-based multi-user chat. And people actually, some of you watching us now can chat, can give us some feedback, can maybe comment on the talks which are going. This is all based on uh, web sockets and on multi-user chat feature. I tried this on my Mac, obviously, but I also tried it on my iPad, and it worked pretty well. So WebSockets are, are nowadays reasonably widely adopted and supported by modern browsers. And there are, there are also all sort of other extensions that you can find on the xmpp.org website. There are tens, if not hundreds of them. They will try to tackle different problems, uh, and you can always propose your own extensions. Here on my slide, I also give examples of some of the other extensions that we currently support in Mongoose, but uh, we are not limited to this. Now, this slide actually, I consider to be one of the most important ones. I know that we came here for scalability thing. <laughs> I, this will be focused on my second part of the presentation, but this, I would like this slide to be one of the takeaways from it. This is really customizable platform. Not only thanks to the XMPP protocol, but also to the modular architecture of, of the server in Erlang. So you can add new modules, Erlang modules, which provide like plugins, and they can hook into so-called hooks. So you can actually have different sort of plugins coexisting. You can plug them in, plug them off. So there is a number of uh, custom modifications that could be developed this way. Uh, could be some authentication plugin or push notification to mobile devices, uh, depending on what you need, or some other extensions. And now, this is another important thing I would like to well, bring to your attention, is that at Erlang Solutions, we've been working also on test suite. It's um, published, it's on GitHub, it's open source. It covers quite some chunk of the Mongoose IM code base. And this has not been seen previously before we forked uh, the original eJabrd project uh, and renamed it Mongoose. Because uh, now, not only you get uh, open source server, but also an open source test suite. Whenever you start to customize your application, add some new, new features, you already have a reasonably good suite of regression tests that you can run and verify. And this is really important because again, as I said, quite often, you will not take software as it is out of the box. You will want to modify it slightly to cater for your needs. Only recently, a few weeks ago, I've seen um, some contributions on the eJabrd mailing list where to sort of <laughs> prove that this uh, contribution can be accepted to the main eJabrd uh, branch. Uh, author of the patch was saying, and by the way, it passes all those uh, ESL uh, eJabrd tests. So, well, point proven. This is exactly what those tests are for. Uh, and again, I would like this slide to be one of the takeaways from this uh, presentation. Okay, so now to the other point where we talk about scalability. Uh, we consider Mongoose IM to be scalable. Um, this can be done, for instance, with uh, the changing different database backends depending on how, what is your target capacity. Um, we can start with a simple, simple deployment where standard Erlang Mnesia database is used for storing passwords, roster, sessions. Then if we need to grow, we could actually use MySQL instead of Mnesia for storing some persistent data like passwords, like uh, uh, roster and, and other pers persistent data. We could even try replacing Mnesia with Redis for the so session storage. I will get into it. 
So those are all different kind of techniques on how you can uh, make this standard mongoose um, configuration to be more, well, to scale to some bigger numbers. Now, the reason why this default version of uh, your configuration actually will use Minesia and will use uh, just Erlang, purely Erlang-based application is uh, because then this way is actually quite easy to just get it to work. So when you download the package with Mongoose IM or you clone source from GitHub, you will just compile it and you will create a release and there are no other dependencies. So you can easily set up some local um, XMPP server instance. Now, so this is good again for starting. Uh, for some deployments, actually it might be also good enough. Uh, I'm talking about the deployments of uh, thousands of users connected and registered, which for some custom deployments of, uh, of the XMPP server, this actually may be just enough. Uh, in those, we would be more interested in throughput of messages flying through the system rather than the actual number of connected or registered users. Now, this is a sketch of uh, architecture. So you see that uh, on the right-hand side, you have um, different plugins that you can enable, disable. Um, WebSockets or multi-user chat is just some of those. Um, then we have the session manager uh, element. This is the black one, uh, which by default is running on Erlang database, Minesia. But we could also replace it with Redis and make it like an external dependency if uh, a need arises. Why this could be good? It could be good because of not only efficiency reasons in some large scale, but also for maybe it's just easier to pull data from Redis for some applications. So maybe actually it might be a way of opening internals of the XMPP server to the world, so to speak, to your third party libraries. And then we have this uh, thing on the left bottom where you can decide what authentication plugin to use. So again, there's a selection of options here. A default would be just to use, use Mnesia again, but you could also use some command line scripts. Uh, you could use uh, some external SQL database. Um, could be anonymous. So different options here. And this is usually the bit that we need to customize for each deployment, because depending on what is the environment you want to integrate the XMPP with, uh, you will have, well, different authentication mechanisms. And, well, in the very bottom, you see also uh, some client handlers. Uh, today, it would be TCP, which is like regular default uh, uh, for XMPP. You could also have WebSockets. We are working on adding uh, Bosch, which is XMPP over HTTP. So this could be yet another way of connecting your clients. Okay, so now on the next slides, I have quite a few different tests um, w that we have performed over the last uh, weeks and months. They were tried on different environments with different configurations. Uh, I know how it is with benchmarks. I mean, one benchmark will really uh, fit your scenario, some other will not. So I would say that this is just to give you an idea of the throughput we can have of what, how would you scale, uh, but as usual, we need to execute some benchmarks on your target environment to actually get a better idea of what is really throughput of your particular system. So to properly plan capacity, we would always recommend to run some stress tests anyway, um, especially if you're planning for high throughput. For this, we use Sung, a tool that has been mentioned quite a few times over the last two days in this conference. Sunk already has support for XMPP, so we do use it. And there is also other software stack uh, for some of those configurations which are listed here. For starters, this is just dedicated box, uh, eight core AMD with 32 gigabytes RAM, uh, with uh, all those persistent data stored in external MySQL database. And this is just so to get started and to get an idea what a single Mangus IM box could handle on such dedicated box. So this is our configuration. This is roughly the scenario we're gonna run. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna first log in all of those users with a rate of 150 per second. So every second we get new 
150 TCP connections established until we get to the point where we have 400,000 users connected. Uh, we don't send any traffic. Those users are shy. <laughs> but uh, this is, again, this test is just to see what would be the memory requirements for that many users online. So I have now two slides that uh, show resource consumption. Uh, first tells how uh, much we saturated CPU. The red line is uh, Mangus IM. The lower, the better. And here we have like 70% of CPU. It's uh, the eight core AMD CPU that we use here. So this is stable. There are no uh, peaks, so well, it's, qu right, it's quite stable. This is, what we do is we log in users. And this is what the memory uh, consumption looks like. So we, again, Mangus is red, and it's linearly scaling. The more users we add, the more memory it needs, but the good news is that this is actually predictable. So um, it's a linearly scalable thing. And we ended up uh, consuming something like 22 gigabytes in total. So there's still like 10 gigabytes left, which will be used for messaging. Once we start chatting, we will, of course, we need to have some extra memory allocated to accommodate those messages being parsed, sent, routed, so I would say that you never want to have many, as many users as you have RAM. You always want to have a good chunk of RAM left free in case people start to send lots of traffic. And actually, this is the, uh, the next test we have performed on this box. Now, instead of trying to aim at a large number of connected users, we aim at a large number of messages sent per second. Now, there is only 75,000 users connected. Uh, because uh, the, the throughput we were trying to get put, send through the system was giving hard time to Tsung nodes. Uh, it was actually quite <laughs> not that easy to kill the server. But still, again, the aim of this test is just to show throughput of messages through the system. So we aim at roughly 20,000 per second. Uh, this is what we get. Uh, this slide, again, uh, shows CPU utilization. Now, you can clearly see there are some two phases in this test. So on the left-hand side, the, the, the first phase of the test is just logging users. We, again, we first need to log them in. Then there is a short break, and then we start sending messages. So now we actually managed to saturate the CPU a bit more. It's something like 80% saturation of CPU, and we are handling roughly 20, 21,000 messages per second. So this is the se second slide. Again, one goes red, lower is better. Memory footprint. So you see that, uh, again, we linearly scale. Once we add users, then we do nothing. So for, for some time, there is really no, um, well, the things are stable. And then at some point, we start sending messages, which of course requires some extra space to parse, to buffer, to send. But things are quite stable. I mean, once, you, once we reached our target uh, throughput of 20-something thousand uh, messages per second, things are OK. All right, so this was the first set of uh, tests, load tests, to give a rough idea of uh, what throughput we are talking about. Again, uh, depending on the size of the messages, depending on uh, size of rosters, uh, all other things need to be taken into account if you really want to plan capacity of your system. So we just picked some values that we felt like could give you an idea, but we would need to be more um, careful to actually um, plan capacity of, of a target system rather than just take the slides and <laughs> plan based on those. But still, it's, those numbers are quite good. OK, and this brings us to another set of tests. Now that I want to show you about, um, uh, show you some things about the running Mongoose in cluster mode, where we have more than one Mongoose IM in an Erlang ring, we need to switch to a different environment. So we decided to go with Amazon EC2. It's not like it's our desired environment for running Mongoose IM, but it's very flexible in terms of 
adding nodes, removing nodes, so it was fairly easy for us to set up some uh, load tests and machines to, to give it a try. Surprisingly, actually, those uh, Mongoose IAM nodes were performing reasonably well on Amazon EC2, uh, but the experience so far with Amazon EC2 is that things can get, uh, well, not easy. <laughs> I mean, nodes going down, showing up again, nodes ending up with very diff distant uh, locations. I would say it's good now for testing, just to give you some idea of uh, what uh, are the scaling steps. But again, I would be careful deploying this in production for um, Amazon EC2. Uh, I've seen people doing this. I've seen some successful projects running on Amazon EC2. Uh, but this uh, has to be carefully considered, especially if we're talking about really, really, really large traffic. Large deployments that we had a chance to work with were rather deployed on dedicated data centers. Okay, so we are trying extra large instances um, of Amazon EC2. We try three Mongoose IAM nodes first, and this is the test we will try. We are going to load 50,000 users. This is like the out-of-the-box configuration, so no external dependencies on MySQL Redis whatsoever. This is just purely Erlang-based deployment, Minesia powering both the persistent and transient data. And let's see what happens. So now, on this slide, I'm trying to show three instances, so Mongoose 1, 2, and 3. And again, first we log them in, second we send some traffic. So this is CPU utilization on those three nodes. They all behave pretty much the same. Uh, the, the strategy of the load test was to balance the load equally. Now, memory, here's actually the opposite. Um, this is free memory. So the higher, the better. Uh, they, the, we run the test until uh, one of those machines almost run out of memory. And now, the interesting thing is that because we used standard, Manisha configuration, standard Mongoose configuration, where all Manisha tables are loaded from disk to memory. And because we had 50,000 users registered and each one of them had the 100 bodies in the roster, we ended up with quite a lot of memory stored in Manisha and then loaded into memory at, well, at the start. So you see that actually the start point for our Mongoose nodes, even though those instances support like 16 gigabytes of RAM, or 15, 16 gigabytes of RAM, actually our starting point is around four, because the amnesia table had to be loaded into RAM. So of course, this is somewhat limiting. I mean, especially if you want to grow the user base. So next step, if you want to scale to higher numbers, would be to move all the persistent data from Nisha to an external database, like MySQL. So this is our next step. This is what we do now. We keep the session data in Nisha, session data being, well, TCP, some uh, presence of uh, subscription list and other things, and other, uh, well, passwords, so whatever it is needed to authent authenticate users, as well as your uh, co list contacts. This is all in MySQL. And now we try to load much higher number of users, over 300,000. This time around, actually, we will be sending presence updates rather than messages. Uh, this is a limitation of the Amazon EC2 and Sung environment on which we were load testing. So actually, it is less uh, expensive for Tsung to generate presence traffic which will actually generate a lot of pressure on the, on the, on the server because, uh, well, each one of those users has 100 friends and every time you change a presence, you need to update all your 100 users. So one small stanza can generate lots of traffic. So uh, this was easier for Tsung to put a lot of pressure on, on the, on the um, server this way. Okay, so let's see how this one went. So we have again, CPU utilization, free Mongoose IAM nodes, uh, something roughly like 70% here to log them in, that's fine. There is the presence phase, uh, which is less stressful for servers. 
But the thing is, this is the key point, is that now we're handling 330,000 users on those three machines, as an opposite to the previous one where we have stored a lot of data in memory. Here actually we start already at the very top, almost 15 gigabytes of uh, RAM free, and then as we log in users, it decreases, and then as we start sending traffic, it decreases. So this is, this is uh, definitely a good configuration if you want to aim at large, large user base. And now, yet another one, having an opportunity to run it on Amazon EC2, we tried another one uh, to see what happens if even the session data, which in a, usually is actually, as long as this is kept in Nisia, it's replicated on all of the nodes. What if would this wouldn't be moved away from the cluster of Erlang nodes to some external fast in-memory storage, like Redis. So again, by default, as we configure Nisia, um, Nisia will be replicating all data across all nodes in the cluster. And the session table, which stores all the sessions, uh, let's say we have 100,000 users logged in on this node, all of those 100,000 sessions will be also replicated into the tables on other two nodes. And this is to facilitate routing. This is why actually um, Mongoose will scale well with Nisha as long as you have a lot of RAM. Because um, routing a message which came in here and has to go out here, uh, it's a quick operation. You just have a look up the local table. <coughs> you know now the PID of the target session because this data has been replicated. And it's a reasonably cheap operation to find out where to route the message. And then it's routed using standard Erlang distribution, and then it's delivered to the process, which uh, is, well, takes care of the session, and then transmitted back on the TCP socket of the target user. But now, so this is why amnesia may consume possibly a bit of too much of memory than you co possibly could really need. So we are trying a configuration with Redis, Slightly different scenario comparing to the previous one. Uh, we try to connect more users, but actually we connect them quicker. Mm, we send messages and see what happens. Now, we have one more node here, which is Redis. This is the blue one, which is in the bottom. You see that this uh, traffic we generated that didn't really stress the Redis node. Uh, Mongoose nodes are a bit stressed because we are logging now quite a few users per second. It is 2,000 users per second on the three nodes. So it's uh, um, well, roughly 700 per second on a node. But because now those Minesia, Minesia nodes don't need to replicate the data as users log in, this actually offloads those nodes. So we can actually push nodes harder. We can have a steeper uh, curve of people logging into the system which in some cases might be actually a requirement to be able to quickly log in users. And again, the second phase is more for sending, even though now we need to actually look up this data in an external data storage. That's OK. It actually works reasonably well. We, we see here like 60% of CPU utilization. That's, that's OK. And in memory-wise, there is a difference. I mean, this, uh, after logging that many users, we end up having something like uh, eight and a half or nine gigabytes RAM free. Previously, we would end up with having like eight. So a couple of hundreds of megabytes have been saved, which on an environment like Amazon could be an issue. If you're running on a dedicated box, it's usually lots of RAM anyway. So Redis may be an option for some deployments. It's not a requirement. Nisha is actually doing reasonably well if you want to deploy clusters of uh, 10 or a dozen uh, Mongoose nodes. So it's not like Redis is a must, but it's an option in Mongoose IM for some specific deployments. 
Okay? Yet another step in scaling I would like to share with you. Um, this one is borrowed from uh, Alexander Fock, system architect at UVU. He had a webinar with me a few weeks ago, so I borrowed some of his slides here. UVU is uh, one of those uh, modern messengers that uh, support uh, video chats, uh, audio chats, text chat. It runs on all sorts of different platforms. And in 2010, they had traffic roughly around uh, 600,000 users connected with 10 million registered and sending 500 messages per second. So this was roughly the uh, scale at the time. But they had to scale to, re to well, bigger numbers because uh, there was constant, rapid usage growth. So after two years, since a new platform has been deployed, an Erlang-based platform has been deployed, they are now running, uh, well, quite a few more machines. Uh, sorry, uh, they support quite a few more users online. 2.2 million online users, uh, 70 million registered, and 10 times more traffic is being pushed through the system. So now, for such large deployment like this one, a single cluster of Mongoose nodes may not be enough. It could be because, uh, well, car traffic coming from different continents and locations. So you may want to have actually um, more than one data center where such XMPP nodes are deployed. Um, it could be also basically to scale to such big numbers. And this is what they do. This is a rough uh, sketch of, of their current configuration. They have two data centers, new one being added. And in those data centers, they deploy so-called scaling units. A scaling unit is like a reason, well, small, but 10 times, the 10 node big cluster of, man, of uh, mongoose-like nodes. So we, we deploy a cluster of nodes, and then we federate between those clusters. So it's like yet one step further. Now you have cluster of clusters. So this is how it works. It's uh, one such scaling unit would have uh, something like 10 Erlang nodes, some extra two for operation and maintenance, so 12 in total in one scaling unit. Data would be stored in MySQL database. There are some also other nodes involved here that uh, help uh, deliver some features for business logic. And you will have several such scaling units federating between each other. So this is how you scale to even bigger numbers. Okay. So if you're considering some messaging platform for a new project or you are facing some scaling issues and you want, are looking for a replacement, um, well, takeaways from this presentation, XMPP helps with interoperability. Um, the Erlang project we're talking about here can be rapidly deployed and customized thanks through some pluggable components. And it's quite efficient. So if you're planning even big numbers, it's not like you will need to buy thousands of boxes. Project is open source. You can find source code on, on GitHub. Um, we also prepackage it for Mac OS, Debian, Ubuntu. But it's fairly easy to build the project from sources. More can be found on the GitHub account. And as usual, we welcome contributions. So that's about it. I see some questions. Okay, C question.
Yeah. Correct. And that's just efficient by further, right? Yes. Did, did you do anything with the offline score or is that not really the uh, No, yes, we did. We did. I mean, here, indeed, focus of the, so just to repeat the question. The question is, what about uh, offline storage? So for users who are not on, online at the time of uh, receiving a message, so that they can pick a message when they log in. Uh, so there is an extension or plugin uh, which defines how you would deliver offline messages uh, in XMPP. Uh, there is a Erlang module which provides such feature for Mongoose. Uh, it's called Mod Offline. Um, by default, it uh, would, uh, again, use Minisia, which has certain scalability limits for disk storage. Uh, successfully, we have used MySQL for such uh, bit larger offline storages, as well as for archives. It could be even RIAC, if you like. I don't think we had a chance to integrate offline in particular with RIAC database, but this could be also another option. So far, uh, at least the scale of offline messages that we had a chance to work with uh, fit MySQL or a cluster of MySQL nodes enough. Okay, a question? Uh, what kind of protocols do you guys use for remote clustering of subscriptions? So, originally this was simply XMPP Federation uh, so the server-to-server -server federation protocol. Later, as it turned out, it was actually it's a bit expensive at the very beginning when you do handshake and you establish the connections. Uh, we just remove for some parts of it uh, and just make it more straightforward. This is a trusted environment. Uh, we don't need to have some heavy authentication routines. Uh, it's still running server to server, so it's XML as defined by RFCs and all this, but it's uh, slightly, well, like it's lightweight, as at least the, the initial phase. And uh, what kind of transport is that? Is that still for long distribution? Or you so, a just to be sure that if you're talking about this, this is over ser XMPP Server Federation. So, this is dedicated TCP connection, this is uh, not Erlang distribution. As far as, we are, as far as we are talking about communication here between nodes within one cluster, yes, this is standard Erlang distribution. So stanzas, those XMPP packets, have some Erlang internal representation, and those Erlang terms are being sent over between nodes until they reach some uh, process which uh, will transform them into XML and send on TCP. Yes, correct. Another question, yes? For the, uh, the Ubu, is that correct? Correct. Um, they're doing video streaming as well. Yes. So are, do you set up the connections and then those are going through some other path or are they also going through the Mongoose site and mm -hmm. session manager and plan? So the question was uh, if uh, the video part of the Ubu application is also somehow supported by this uh, Erlang-based system. Uh, well, er, the, um, the chat feature uh, is used to signal certain events between endpoints, but the actual video streaming is a separate feature. It's not in a, like in the scope of this uh, IM server that I had a chance to discuss. So it's a separate media uh, cluster. Another question? Uh, do you guys support multiple, multiple connections per single user? The same way like VJBRD does? Yes. Okay. Mongoose, uh, well, started as a fork of VJBRD. Uh, so we have just removed some of the bottlenecks that we have uh, learned about while working with it. But uh, it is the same plugin architecture as found in VJBRD. Actually, and uh, as an example of nice open source uh, thing, uh, EJBRD team has today announced that they have released a new community uh, version of EJBRD and they have migrated uh, to Mongoose IM like uh, internal representation of terms, which was using, which now uses binaries, Erlang binaries, rather than Erlang strings, which is uh, better, well, memory wise. So, this, I mean, even though this project has started as a fork of EJBRD, 
And for the last two years, those were rather different as far as the internal representation is concerned. As I have read only a few hours ago, uh, now this EJBRD project also has migrated towards this internal representation, which is great, which is a, an excellent example of how open source is powerful. Uh, even though those are two forks, now we sort of again contribute to each other. Uh, so, well. So, like for instance, everybody complains how Skype does compared to Skype and how there is a replicating messages that there's multiple things coming mm -hmm. to the user. Do you see any of that problem? Mm -hmm. Do you think that your solution is just... Okay, so, so the question is, uh, what if user has more than one active session? How do we cope with it? Okay, as far as XMPP is concerned, um, each user session can be identified uh, you with a so-called uh, resource. So your user ID consists of like username at uh, domain name slash some resource name. So the user could be connected over more than one session and could be uh, uniquely identified f by resource. There are some extensions proposed on the xmpp.org website that try to tackle this problem. Mm, what if, yeah. By default, EJBRD just has priorities, and so does Mongoose. So basically the last session which was active, like sending messages, is considered to be highest priority, and traffic will be delivered only to this highest priority session. But uh, this is open source, and like, it is fairly easy to modify this and make them all sort of equal, so that every time you send a message, all active sessions would receive a copy of the same message. This could be an option. But this is not the default behavior. Okay? Another question? Uh, I guess this is related to like mobile, like to mobile clients. Okay. Um, frequently the disconnect is not graceful. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're connected to an access point and the connection is still active, but th then you walk away. Uh, does EJMD or Mongoose uh, clean up these connections and sessions correctly? Like how do you, how do you clean up those sessions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, in disruptive networks, when yeah. mobile clients, for instance, would uh, often go online and offline, and they would not necessarily clean up, uh, what, how do we deal with this? So there are, well, different issues here. <laughs> one is, uh, indeed, to check health of a connection. Uh, one of the extensions uh, discusses ping. So there's mode ping for, for those, you can ping on a regular basis, every few minutes, uh, your users, and if they don't respond, you consider their sessions to be dead, and you simply terminate it on your end. <laughs> this is one idea. Now, if, if that's not something that's built into Mongo, is that something you would have to add as a... No, it's, I mean, again... The module is built in, but is that something extra that would have to... It's okay, it's as hard as configuring it in the configuration file, so that instead of uh, running some standard uh, plugins, uh, you would also add in the list of plugins in the configuration file this mod ping. Now, this could be a good thing or a bad thing. A good thing is because now we can check health of those uh, links. The bad thing is that we keep polling users and they need to keep receiving these messages and keep sending them us back, which uh, in some situations is not something you want. <laughs> so another approach to the problem would be to, to be less eager, if I can say so, less eager in finding out what's the current health of this connection, and only when we send a message to the user, sort of ask him to also acknowledge receiving a message, and so when we send a message and the user does not respond with an acknowledgement, then we consider him to be dead. And actually, I think S Skype was mentioned here, I think this is what Skype does. Sometimes s people appear online, but as soon as you try to send them a message, they suddenly disappear because you find out, oh, actually, they were online some time ago. They never really propagated, presence updated. They are now going offline, but they are actually offline. So this is less eager, but then it's less precise. So for some reasons, it could not be the way you want it. Uh, but again, so this is another way of trying to address the problem, which actually also tackles another problem, which is uh, how do we make sure that messages are delivered 
in the first place in such disruptive networks. Uh, because uh, as we see those uh, smartphones being connected through uh, APN, some all sort of uh, and proxies, those proxies are not always honest with us, I mean the, the server side, about whether the connection is really up or not. Uh, so it can take quite some time for the TCP um, socket to, well, f come to a conclusion that this user is actually not connected anymore. Um, is, is it possible to detect, for, for a to detect when, the so when there's a socket error and then clean up the session? The question is if we can auto-detect some of those scenarios. Uh, well, Mangus is based on the standard Erlang Gen TCP. As long as this, uh, the, on the TCP layer, uh, you would receive some sort of TCP close or other kind of uh, TCP signaling, yes, we would close TCP socket on the server side and this would cascade to Mongoose to close the session. Um, yes, however, again, sometimes actually you, you send bytes on the socket, you, you feel like you sent, the, delivered the message, but actually never really reached the endpoint. So for this to happen, there again, there have been some extensions to XMPP protocol proposed. You can find them on xmpp.org. One of them being 198, some other are 184. Maybe there are even more. Um, and we had a chance to, to implement some of those for various uh, implementations. Um, we can talk about it a bit more if you like. Sure, yeah. um, but uh, yes, this problem has been <laughs> tackled one way or another. It very much depends, again, on what is the application use case and it's not like one solution fits all. Sure. All right? Okay, do we have any more questions? No, so we are good to go for the Erlang meetup later tonight. Thank you.